Shortly after midnight on Saturday 30th of August 1997, Princess Diana and her boyfriend Dodi Fayed leave the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Henri Paul, the head of Ritz Hotel security, takes the wheel. The lovers are attempting to give the paparazzi the slip as they head for a fire department off the Champs-Élysées. It would be a fatal journey. A crash in a tunnel would kill Henri Paul and Dodi instantly. Princess Diana, the most famous woman in the world, would die soon afterwards. Had Diana not been involved, the crash might have been seen as a tragic accident. But within hours of her death, bizarre conspiracy theories appeared on the internet. Soon, there were tens of thousands of websites devoted to Diana's death. Television programs pick up the theme. There remains a widespread belief that this official story of a kind of a run-of-the-mill tragic case of drunk, high-speed driving really isn't the whole thing. Was Princess Diana's death the result of a simple accident, or was it something more sinister? Some plot to kill Diana and Dodie by dark and sinister forces. That I personally cannot dismiss the possibility of negligent or even premeditated homicide. Did the British royal stand to gain anything by having Diana Spencer whacked instead of standing by and watching the heir of the British throne have a Muslim stepdaddy? Do we have opinions from our opinionated panel? Ice, what do you think? I, I believe that the uh, royal family didn't want her to get married to that guy. Today, public opinion surveys show that many people simply do not believe it was an accident. She was such an extraordinary woman that people find it very difficult to accept that she could have died such an ordinary death. I think that's a problem that people have. I don't know, I think it's all a bit too convenient for it to just be an accident. I think they couldn't break her, she had to die. She got too big for her boots, I think. She got too politically vocal. Needed to be killed off, I think. The royalty wanted her out of the way. You know, the fact that, you know, it took the ambulance two hours to get to the hospital when it was only 10 minutes away, it's just too much going on. A letter, allegedly sent by the princess to her former butler, Paul Burrell, speculated about a plot to kill her in a car crash. Then the Daily Mirror revealed Prince Charles was the alleged plotter. Sales shot up. So in terms of impact on circulation, Diana is twice as big since she died as she was when she was alive and twice as big as anything else that we've touched. I mean, really quite extraordinary. Conspiracy theories damaged the royal family's image and also harmed Britain's reputation in the Muslim world. The Arab uh, believe that the British intelligence service and the French and intelligence service are working together to hide the truth and to cover the murder of the Princess of Wales. And they give a reason for this plot because the British royal family would not accept uh, a Muslim Egyptian stepfather for the future king of England. Actually, our uh, circulation increased by 25 to 30 percent because of this story. High-profile deaths often produce conspiracy theories, but this crash has taken on a life of its own. We show how Mohammed Fayed has orchestrated and financed his own theory of Princess Diana's death. Absolute, cold-blooded murder. Terrorist murder is not, they say they're fighting terrorists and themselves are real terrorists. This theme has a new twist in Fayed's latest conspiracy project, linking the royals to the Nazis. How credible are these claims? Channel 4 has new documents from the Paris investigation. We talk to witnesses of Diana's and Henri Paul's autopsies. And we have the first ever TV interview with the head of the French police inquiry into the crash. 
Two days after the crash, French police revealed that Diana's driver had been more than three times over the drink drive limit. Four days later, there was a press conference in Fayette's London department store, Harrods. I remember it was very short notice, and we all arrived sort of rather breathlessly and crammed ourselves in and sat down. No one quite knew what was going to be said. You know, it could have been the reading of one sheet of A4 paper saying, Mr Alfard would like to say thank you very much for the condolences and he is or isn't going to the Abbey or whatever. Um, but actually it turned out to be something altogether more extraordinary. We owe it to everyone to now examine the evidence which you should see. And then um, he produced a security video which blew everyone away. Certainly everybody was paying extremely close attention to what we were seeing because we knew it was something quite extraordinary. To see the footage of her, that distinctive blonde head, in that, in that sort of grainy video, there was something disconcerting about it. Henri Pohl did not have any appearance of being overexcited and drunk as a pig, a quotation which incidentally appears again in the Evening Standard this evening. You will see the evidence for yourself. They also showed us this video, which they said proved that he wasn't drunk. And of course, he didn't appear drunk, but then I know people who are drunk who seem extremely dignified when drunk. In a way, everything that you read since does come from that press conference because that was when um, the Al Fayed version of events was set out. And what he said subsequently has all been uh, based very much on those, um, those key beliefs. Mohammed Fayed believes the royals felt threatened by his son's relationship with Diana. Prince Philip will never have allowed my son as an Egyptian naturally tanned will be the stepfather of Prince William and future king. Fueled by Fayed's PR machine, the romance between Dodi and Diana had looked like it was getting serious. Public kisses made headlines around the world and there were even rumours of an engagement. After the couple died, Fayed made this claim to a credulous ITV. And then they called me and said, what's happening? And then we're having dinner and after that going back to the apartment. And uh, we're coming back on Sunday and on Monday, they already declared their engagements. Did Dodi tell you that? Did Diana Dodi tell you that? Dodi told me that and Diana told me that on Saturday evening at 10 o'clock in the hotel. Did Diana speak to you in that conversation? Yeah. Diana's close friends find that difficult to believe. Rosa Moncton went to Greece with her only 10 days before she died. And we both decided we needed a holiday. Um, and so off we went, uh, just for six days. We left on the 15th of August. And some friends of mine lent us a little boat, a tiny little boat, and we went off and had wonderful fun. She was, she was happy, she was relaxed. Um, we had just lots of girl talk, you know, when there's two girls together, you talk about things that matter. She talked about her new relationship with Dodi, and she talked about other relationships and her family and everything, we talked about everything. You know, it was very new. She was right at the beginning of it, and she was just enjoying herself. She was basically, in my view, and I actually put this to her, I said, what you're doing is having your teenage years now. You know, you're having fun, you're having a fling, and, and you're enjoying it, and so you should. But in my view, it was no more than that. On the night she died, Diana phoned Richard Kay on his mobile. The Daily Mail's royal correspondent was her closest press contact. She was saying to the world, yes, I found someone, I'm very happy with them. But that was, that's a completely different uh, stage from we're going to get engaged, we're going to be married. I didn't get that impression at all. Um, and this whole ring business, I've, um, I've been very dubious about. In the Harrod Shrine to Dodie and Diana, an expensive ring is permanently displayed as being the couple's engagement ring. The jeweler who made the ring now says he is sure that it was an engagement ring. 
So Diana actually put this ring on. Yeah, I want to be sure to sides because, and, well, and I made myself personally. I don't send anybody there. Uh, I think that is enough. If I say that they told me that was a, well, was an engagement ring. He also gave Channel 4 a CCTV footage of Dodi allegedly collecting the famous ring on his last evening. Raposi was interviewed by Channel 4 after Diana's death. Curiously, with events then fresh in his mind, his recollection of the encounter was quite different. He claims what he said then was to protect Diana's sons. I don't know if it was an engagement ring. They come specifically for for this ring and they want this ring. They don't, don't say nothing. I don't know absolutely nothing. Immediately after the crash, the fired spokesman also had no idea of the ring's significance. What that ring meant, we shall probably never know. And if the planet lasts for another thousand years, I'm quite sure that people will continue to speculate about its significance. But Diana herself had been very clear about the nature of the relationship when she spoke to Rosa Monckton. She said, I'm sure one of the next things will be a ring. And she said, Rosa, that is firmly going on the fourth finger of my right hand. So no thoughts in her mind of an engagement? Absolutely none whatsoever. The next part of the myth is that they were not just engaged, but they had already looked around a prospective home, the Villa Windsor outside Paris. TV in 1998 didn't question this story. But he decided, you know, and she decided that this is the place she loved. She found that this is the place for her, and a very secure place. And it's just near London. She would be at home. And it was just the right uh, nest for them to, to continue their happiness and continue their life. But they're gone. The romantic nest was at the heart of the fired fantasy. Royal historian Robert Lacey was writing a book about the sale of the Villa Windsor's furniture and effects. I then got in touch with Harrods and went to see Michael Cole in Mr. Al Fayed's office. I actually spoke at that time to Mr. Al Fayed on the phone. And although I was there on auction house business, as it were, um, looking into the sale, what I discovered they were keen to get across to me was the idea of love engagement, um, the idea that uh, um, Diana and Dodie were actually planning to live um, in the Windsor's house. ITV met up with the Villa's butler. They chose not to challenge his statement on the programme that the couple spent two hours looking around their potential new home. Do you remember the, the, the last day they came here? Yeah, 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 sure. Do you remember them coming? Do you remember what happened? He, he, he's coming and see the house, spent two hours if all around the house to visit everything, everything. Ah, good morning. Morning. Nicholson. The butler's story was the last straw for the villa security guard, Ben Morel, who left his job in 1998 and told his story to the Sun newspaper. At the Villa Windsor, uh, Mr. Alfired had claimed that they had spent several hours looking around the villa with a view to moving there and possible marriage. Now, when we spoke to Ben, uh, he was able to produce uh, several CCTV camera shots, which was uh, which are able to conclusively prove that um, Diana spent less than half an hour at the villa, as opposed to the two hours that Mr. Alfire had been claiming. Good morning. morning. And what's more, the butler, Gregorio Martin, who had vividly recalled the couple's visit for ITV, hadn't even been there at the time. He wasn't there, this, this retainer Grigor. He had, in fact, had an accident on the way back from Spain. The only person at Villa Windsor the day the Princess of Wales and Dodie came to visit was Ben Morell. The Sun published a front-page story exposing the deception. It was a headline fired, tried, but failed to stop in the High Court. Soon after Diana left the villa, she spoke to her confidant, Richard Kay. She mentioned that um, during the day they been out to the to the Bois de Boulogne and been to the Windsor house um, Duchess of Windsor lived in and I asked her well what was it like she said it was full of old ghosts and I thought that's a very telling phrase and not for you she said not for me 
And so Diana was not planning to get engaged to Dodi Fayed, nor was she planning a new life with him. But what of Mohammed Fayed's sensational claim that she was pregnant by Dodi when she died, which he believes would have provided a motive for murder? In part two, we explore. Mohammed Fayed is now certain that Princess Diana was pregnant by Dodi, which would have provided a motive for the royal family to arrange her murder. He began by claiming that the royal family could not envisage the possibility of a Muslim child by the mother of the future King of England. Then he made a claim that shocked the world. There's some talk that Diana was pregnant. What do you think and what do you know about that? Definitely. She was? The, definitely. Dodi's child? Definitely, definitely. And Dodi this confirmed this to me. He told already, you. already. A photo taken that summer appears to show Diana with a possible bump, which helped to start the rumors after she died. But what's the evidence? Channel 4 has spoken to people who know. Do you think it's possible she could have been pregnant? No, I know for an absolute fact that she could not have been pregnant because when we were on the boat, which was 10 days before she died, she had her period, so she could not have been pregnant. On her last day in England, Diana visited Dr. Lily Yu. She had treated the princess here in Camden for 18 months for premenstrual tension. Diana saw me on the 21st of August, and she was not pregnant then. It would not have been possible for her to be so when she died. The crucial medical evidence comes from her autopsy. Diana's body was flown home to Britain on the day she died, and her post-mortem took place at the Fulham Mortuary in London. Working with the Home Office pathologist was the mortuary manager, Robert Thompson. He speaks to British TV for the first time. Diana's body didn't arrive until 8 o'clock in the evening, so it was a very long day. Um, we simply finished Dodie's post-mortem, cleaned down, disinfected the mortuary and prepared it for Diana's arrival. The inter internal examination proceeded much as they always do. The organs were removed in this case, as they always are, by the pathologist, Dr Chapman with myself only providing assistance where necessary. Um, Dr Chapman removed the organs and then examined them on a dissecting bench very closely. Dr Chapman and I were standing opposite each other over the body. Dr Chapman in situ divided the uterus, looked up and said, oh well, she wasn't pregnant, in a voice that was not just directed at me but at the room in general. Also at the post-mortem was former Royal Coroner Dr John Burton, who recently stated categorically that Diana was not pregnant. Channel 4 has discovered that the only post-mortem that took place was in Fulham. The French medics had more pressing concerns when Diana was admitted. Thierry Marès was the hospital spokesman at the time of her death. When this type of patient arrives, pregnant or not, the only goal of the hospital is to save her life. And when you don't know the blood group, you don't do a blood test, you give what we call universal blood. We always have a reserve of blood which can be given to anyone without any problem. So our sole concern was not to discover whether she was pregnant, but to save her life. We didn't do any tests to see if she were pregnant, so no one can know whether she was or not. So what of that photograph, which allegedly supported the rumour? That turns out to have been taken on the 14th of July 97, before Diana had met up with Dodi in France. However, Fayed has told people across the world that Princess Diana was pregnant. She was pregnant, and I know that. Yeah. How did you know that? She told me on the phone. She told you on the phone? Yeah. Totally convinced of the motive for murder, Fayed cannot see the event in Paris as a simple traffic accident. But an exhaustive two-year French investigation has left no room for doubt. Blood tests concluded that the driver of Diana's car 
was more than three times over the drink drive limit. He was also taking prescription drugs, which warn users not to drink. He lost control of the Mercedes as it sped into the Alma Tunnel at more than twice the speed limit. The French investigation found a Ritz bar bill for two glasses of Rica for Paul's table. Princess Diana's bodyguard said they were unaware that Paul was drinking alcohol as his Rica looked like pineapple juice. Paul's autopsy made it clear that he had consumed far more than those two glasses. But Fayed has disputed this in receptive US TV interviews. You see him on a video, I see he's complete, 100%, fine. super fine, talking to everybody, giving instruction to everyone. But he changed the blood oh. of Henry Paul with somebody else. Could the French have possibly switched the blood samples in the labs? Could the official investigation itself be contaminated? Channel 4 approached the head of the French police investigation to find out. Jean-Claude Moulez secured the crash site on the night and later attended Henri Paul's autopsy. In his first ever TV interview, we asked him, could there have been a blood swap? It's impossible. impossible. The rigour with which the sampling procedure is conducted body by body make it impossible. Every corpse has a reference, a registration number, a name, a forename and a registration number. In addition, the administration prints a sticky identity label. First name, registration number, all of which are done in real time. À identifier les prélèvements qui sont faits en temps réel. Henri Paul's parents were shocked at the idea of their son being drunk, so the investigating judge, Hervé Stéphan, double-checked the results. He personally supervised the analysis of a second set of samples from Paul's corpse. To remove all doubt, he recorded the entire process on video. The second set of results on the autopsy confirmed within a tenth of a milligram the first set. Other findings from the autopsy were selectively leaked by Fayed. It is argued that the blood must have been taken from the wrong man, as there was a strangely high level of carbon monoxide in Paul's blood. Had his level been that high, he would have appeared unstable and hardly able to walk. There were two levels of carbon monoxide taken from two parts of the body. One was high, 20.7%, and one was low, 12.8%. Averaged out, they would be consistent with a heavy smoker. Henri Paul was seen smoking throughout the evening by both bodyguards and paparazzi. The French investigation concluded that the levels were of no significance. Commander Moulez has no doubt about the conclusions. For me, Personally, I go back to the authority of the judge's findings. It was a traffic accident, which is sad. But from the legal point of view, a traffic accident, as I've said. Full stop. Immediately after the accident and before any facts were known, the investigative journalist Tom Bauer penetrated the closed world of the Ritz. And I was told to report to uh, an airfield where the Harrods helicopter would be taken off. We got to Paris. I was taken straight to the Ritz. I waited around for about an hour. And then I was taken into a room and told, this is where all the staff will meet you. And one by one, all the senior staff, the low staff, everyone who'd come into contact with Diana and Daddy on that fateful day uh, were brought into the room for me to interview. The atmosphere in the Ritz, you can imagine, was pretty tense. The staff were absolutely shaken. 
Um, it was an extraordinary opportunity to sit there and talk to them all, even before they talked to the police. The police hadn't yet got to the Ritz. Uh, so I sat and talked to them one by one as they came in. Bauer discovered by talking to bodyguard Kez Wingfield the critical decisions that had immediately preceded Diana's last journey. They were decisions that would haunt Fayed forevermore. The key point was that uh, they had agreed uh, secretly between Dodi and Mohammed on the phone very late at night that to avoid the paparazzi, they were going to conduct this extraordinary escapade using a hired car from the back of the Ritz, driven by Henri Paul to escape the paparazzi. Henri Paul was acting head of security at the Ritz and not a licensed chauffeur. But in the phone call, Mohammed Fayed personally sanctions the plan for Paul to drive. Close Circuit TV picks up the story. The bodyguards insist that at least one of them should be in the car. After an argument, Dodie agrees to take Trevor Rhys Jones. The party leaves by the back door with Henri Paul, but without the normal backup car. The two fully qualified official chauffeurs are left at the front of the hotel. The rest is history. This was one of his cars going from one of his hotels to one of his apartments, you know, with one of his security men at one side of the car and his driver at another side. Obviously, I think Mohammed Al Fayed will every day wish he'd done something different. This is a guy who's incredibly powerful, incredibly rich, who can do anything he wants within reason. And he was unable to stop this happening. He had to explain why he'd agreed late at night to this madcap scheme to take her out the back door with a drunken driver in a rented car at ludicrous speed across Paris. There's so much for him to explain. And it is natural to Mohammed Fayed when he's in that sort of situation to come up with all sorts of conspiracies and stories and scenarios which don't fit the truth, but actually do protect his own reputation. It was a plot, conspiracy, to get rid of Diana and my son and I am not going to rest until get the truth. Before Princess Diana's body had left France, two top fired officials went to Paris police headquarters to sow the first seeds of conspiracy theory. They told the gendarmes that Dodi had received death threats. In part three, we reveal how this visit was the start of Fayed's international campaign, which would eventually argue that the royal family conspired to murder Princess Diana. Channel 4 has seen a new, as yet unreleased, video documentary produced by Mohammed Fayed. It's called the Alma Tunnel Mystery. It maintains that there are just too many unanswered questions surrounding the crash. It claims the British royal family has a long history of murdering opponents who disagree with it. It accuses Prince Philip of having Nazi links in his past and of masterminding the plot to murder Diana through secret agents from MI6. Across the Atlantic, the belief in conspiracy has taken root. Comedian and chat show host Richard Belzer develops the theme in an uncritical way. In considering conspiracies, I always start off by asking myself, who stands to gain? Like, for instance, did the British royal stand to gain anything by having Diana Spencer whacked instead of standing by and watching the heir of the British throne have a Muslim stepdaddy? Some people believe that because Diana was going to marry Dodi, yeah. that they couldn't have that, that that would somehow dilute the monarchy, that they didn't want an Egyptian stepfather yeah. for the boys, and this it was just, it's just as basic as that. That's absolutely that right. An Egyptian, you know, right. uh, uh, t naturally tanned, her daddy have uh, curly hair, you know, and he have the same, you know, it's just they will not accept that.
Other conspiracists have taken the story further, like the American Jeffrey Steinberg. His organization believes the royals are involved in all sorts of international conspiracies, and that the queen is the head of a cocaine ring, and that MI6 is her personal secret service. His acute eyesight managed to spot the MI6 agents on Ritz video pictures, waiting in the crowd just before the crash. There were two men uh, in the Place Vendôme in front of the hotel from the point that Diana and Dodie arrived right up through the point that they left. And these two people have not been identified by anybody. Uh, they were not guests in the hotel. They were not tourists. They were not paparazzi. And they were clearly there at the edge of the crowd surveilling events for a good two, two and a half hours. If, and I emphasize the word if, we are dealing here with a professional assassination. A target of opportunity, a decision by a highly professional team on the spot, uh, the kind of thing where you could activate something and still have the option of calling it off at the last minute. The forces of darkness were first seen by British TV viewers in 1998. The program did not question the evidence of a Frenchman, Francois Levistre, who claimed he saw a flash before the crash in the Alma Tunnel. The flash? Was this flash like a photo flash? No, no, it was stronger than a photo flash. The Mercedes goes left, right, left. ITN's royal correspondent developed the idea. Now this is an anti-personnel device, quite legal to buy in the UK, which sets off one enormously powerful flash of light. Shine this in somebody's eyes and they'll be stunned, disabled, blinded for several minutes. If you're driving a car when it happens, you'll almost certainly crash. Then former MI6 man Richard Tomlinson took up the theme. He was paid by Fayed before giving evidence to the French inquiry. The theory gained worldwide credence, and Tomlinson recalled a similar British scheme on US TV. I mean, when I was in MI6, I uh, saw a plan to assassinate um, Slobodan Milosevic, who was at the time was a Serbian president. It was a contingency plan, he says, to kill the leader of Serbia on a visit to Geneva. The plan basically was to cause his car to crash in a tunnel. The former intelligence officer tells Cornwell the proposal called for using a flash gun, a device he says is used by British special forces to blind an adversary. A brilliant flash of light at just the right moment. Is this what the eyewitness says he saw? Channel 4 has discovered that Levistre is a convicted petty criminal. During a jail sentence, he was described by his prison visitor as a pathological liar and a fantasist, but he was deemed credible by ITV, who did not check his record. The French police discounted him as a reliable witness. We showed his ITV interview to the head of the police investigation. Commander Moules did not believe his story. When you're in the tunnel, and on top of that in the dark, you can see you're forced to it's staggering. It's someone's mind playing tricks, imagination run wild. I would call this, in my opinion, nonsense. That this witness might have seen some flashes, okay. Some paparazzi overtaking him, perhaps. Did, did you ever hear this um, allegation made by this witness, Francois Levistre? Yes. Now I'm starting to remember. I remember, and it wasn't the only one. There were many people who wanted to make themselves out to be more important than they were in reality, who needed to make up stories and tell things to show off. But very quickly their testimonies, which were handled with extreme caution, were destroyed from start to finish. This is the job of the examinations that we do at the criminal brigade. We take everything through right to the end, and we see if the person, the witness, is credible or not. We have ways through questioning to separate what is well-grounded from what is imagination storytelling, which is his way, and it never fails. Key to another conspiracy theory is the role of a white Fiat Uno, which was seen by two witnesses leaving the tunnel. The Fiat's paint marks were found on the wrecked Mercedes. 
The fact that the Fiat has never been found has added to the mystery. Some suggest it was used as a murder weapon. Uh, vehicular homicide would, would imply basically that this was a willful intent to cause a collision uh, that would either be fatal for the passengers in the car, in the Mercedes, or would uh, at least severely injure the people in the car. Other critics of the investigation were astounded that the French could not find the elusive Fiat. You've got the biggest car hunt of all time. Why couldn't you find it? Why didn't you get off your asses quicker and get it? Um, you know, I just think it's a perfectly valid criticism. Fired himself offered a £1 million reward to anyone who could find the Fiat. Then he claimed in an accepting Channel 5 documentary that his team had found the car. It was our investigators, not the French police, who found the Fiat Uno. It was found in a garage in Paris and traced to a paparazzi named James Andonson. James Andonson, the Fiat's owner, had been photographing Diner and Dodi in the south of France. The story took an even more sinister turn when it was found Andonson had apparently committed suicide. This caused Channel 5 and others to speculate uncritically about the possible forces of darkness. In June 2000, Andonson apparently committed suicide by setting fire to himself in his car on this piece of army land. Both friends and even the funeral director are very skeptical that Andonson really killed himself. Commander Moulez personally interviewed James Andonson and found his Fiat off the road and on blocks. His name was James Andonson. His past was even more mysterious than Henri Paul. La, la Fiat, you disais. He was using the Fiat way before, certainly before 1997, since the car had 325,000 kilometers on the clock. When a car like this has done 325 or 400,000 kilometers, it's given up the ghost. And that's why he had placed it on bricks, and he wasn't using it anymore. I believe the car wasn't even insured, so that explains it. Forensic tests proved decisively that the paint did not match the car that had hit the Mercedes. French scientists also established that the speed of the Mercedes had caused the crash rather than its brush with the Fiat. Channel 4 has obtained evidence and police diagrams that illustrate the crash between the Mercedes and the Fiat. It shows the position of the broken tail light of the Fiat and the glass from the wing mirror of the Mercedes. We showed the diagrams to the leading British car crash expert, Dr Murray Mackay. The marks, for example, on the right side mirror of the Mercedes uh, would have come from the uh, left rear corner of the Fiat Uno, and that the um, brake light cover on the Fiat Uno would have been damaged, consistent with marks on the right front wing of the Mercedes. So they were able to establish that this was a, a minor scrape, a, a glancing contact. Um, that wouldn't have deviated the path of the Mercedes significantly. It's just a, a brushing contact, that it wasn't a, a major impact in any sense. So the Fiat Uno could not accurately be described as the cause of the crash? I don't think so. I think it's an incidental event. The, the car is clearly being driven at very high speed. The entrance to that tunnel is a little challenging in the sense that you have a dip that you go over a rise down into the tunnel itself. At the same time, you have a left-hand bend. If you're driving at high speed, if you're drunk, um, then it's easy to get out of control. La Fiat Uno, qui pas très the Fiat Uno was not going very quickly. And you also realize that for a car going at high speed, there is a slope at six degrees and a kind of bump, which might have unbalanced the Mercedes, or at least Henri Paul's driving. Henri Paul, who perhaps was surprised to lose control of his car, and on top of that, the brush with the Fiat Uno, we know the rest. Despite the French forensic conclusions, the failure to find the Fiat harmed the reputation of the investigation and provided much scope for attacking French competence. The French emergency services also came under attack. Across the Atlantic, they did not appear to understand how French medics work. According to media reports, Diana was semi-conscious, but had signs of internal bleeding, low blood pressure, and difficulty breathing. 
and for some as yet unexplained reason, it took one hour and 43 minutes from the time of the crash to deliver Diana to a hospital that was only 3.8 miles away. Why? Was this incompetence or part of a plot to ensure that Diana died? French records show two ambulances arrived just six minutes after the crash. So how did it take nearly two hours to get Diana to a hospital? The president of the emergency ambulance service is Dr. Marc Chirou. At the very beginning of uh, uh, her situation, she had a heart attack. And she had to be treated before uh, going to the hospital. Otherwise, she would have died on the scene. She was resuscitated at, at the moment uh, she had this heart attack. But uh, after that, she had blood pressure problems. And when you do not have a good uh, pressure, you have to be very, very uh, prudent, very slow in the driving to transport a patient in this condition. And uh, they have to uh, uh, treat the patient during the transport. So it is the way we act in France. French policies to treat patients in state-of-the-art ambulances, particularly when their condition is critical, whereas the Americans and the British prefer to race victims to hospital as quickly as possible. Diana was not taken to the nearest hospital, but to the best one for treating her condition. Then the French police were criticized for opening the tunnel to traffic so quickly. More cover-up than clean-up claims Fyde's head of security in Channel 5's unchallenging documentary. Whether this was something other than a traffic accident or not, something of this magnitude involving Diana, Princess of Wales, the scene should have been preserved. So was the tunnel cleared too quickly? Commander Moulez took that decision. The scene was preserved straight after the accident until I arrived. When I arrived, I continued preserving the scene. But once my work was done, there was no reason. I had not found anything else. I wasn't going to seal off the tunnel and stop the traffic. It's unthinkable. The procedures which I put into effect were very, very precise. Nothing was left to chance. We combed it millimetre by millimetre. No other element significant to the investigation could have been discovered. I had no reason, once the Mercedes had been taken away, to block the scene. I wasn't going to turn it into a shrine. Did Commander Moulez make the correct decision? Well, I can't see that there was anything lost in, for example, uh, the time that was um, spent at the scene and then when you've finished, as is typical with any even fatal road accidents, um, you know, the scene is cleared, it's time to get traffic moving. Um, you record the evidence photographically, you take measurements, you collect uh, components, debris at the scene. I can't think that there was anything more that would have been achieved had they kept the tunnel closed for another 24 hours. Yet another fired myth, dispelled by the facts. From the moment Diana died, Fired's team have spread disinformation about the crash. His spokesman, Michael Cole, claimed at that first press conference that Fired had received Diana's last words and had seen her body in the hospital. So Fired also visited Princess Diana and said she looked beautiful and serene. Fayed did briefly visit the hospital, but could he have penetrated the tight security? I very much doubt it, because as far as security was concerned, it was so tight that even for me to get near the body, I had to pass through various checks to prove my credentials, even when Professor Lecomte was expecting me to help her. So I sincerely doubt that anyone else could have. You needed a passport to get anywhere near Diana. This myth was the first amongst many. 
Fayed has spent more than £5 million on propagating conspiracy theories with no evidence to support them. Although none of his legal actions over the crash have succeeded, his PR offensive has been very effective in the court of public opinion. He now claims 85% of British people believe there was dirty work afoot in the Alma Tunnel. I think the Fayed campaign uh, has been brilliant in its achievements. One may dislike the methods, but the way in which over the years more and more people have come to believe Mr. Fayed's um, uh, explanation and theories about what happened that dark night, to the extent of accusing Prince Philip, whom we now know was actually much more on Diana's side than anybody realized, illustrates what have been called the dark arts of public relations and news manipulation and that much overused word, spin. The effect of the spin is to draw attention away from the fatal phone call which determined Diana's fate. Although Fayed's version of the conversation changes frequently, the bodyguards never change their story. Fayed personally permitted Diana to be driven by his head of RID security, Henri Paul. They sped away from the hotel with a fraction of the security that Fayed always insists on for himself. You know, her whole life was, you know, people always spun stories about her. I mean, so often when I picked up a newspaper and read somewhere where we'd been together, you know, there was not hardly any truth in it at all. It happened throughout her life and it is continuing to happen after her death. People like to invent things. Mohamed Fayed declined to take part in this program, saying he had grave concern about the motivation and agenda of those making it. His statement continued. I have not been given the opportunity to view this film. The proper forums in which all of the circumstances relating to the deaths should be investigated are, of course, the coroner's inquest, the related police inquiry, and most importantly, in a full public inquiry for which I continue to press. I have no intention, therefore, of subjecting myself to trial by media, particularly when, as in this case, the views expressed and the conclusions reached are so subjective and unbalanced when set against the very many important unanswered questions and suspicious circumstances surrounding the deaths. I know the vast majority of the British public does not accept that Diana's and Dodie's deaths were a mere accident, and, as the grieving father, I certainly will not rest until I have uncovered the truth. It is regrettable that neither Martin Gregory, the producer of this programme, nor Channel 4 shares this ambition. Diana's and Dodie's separate inquests have now opened to massive international interest. They will resume next year after the royal coroner, Michael Burgess, has been painstakingly through the French evidence. He has asked the Metropolitan Police to investigate allegations of murder. And so finally, Fayed's conspiracy theories may be tested in a British court. Do you think Diana's death was an accident or part of a conspiracy? You can vote by text. Send the word accident or conspiracy, depending on your answer, to 83188. Digital satellite viewers can vote by pressing the red button and results can be found tomorrow at channel4.com slash Diana. Next tonight, Father Ted.